Yes, hello. Um, thank you for the introduction. So I'm here with uh, my colleague Andreas. And uh, I guess like you just heard, we're going to talk about our uh, project uh, that we worked on a few months back, uh, where we took apart a electric car charger. Uh, so we're kind of going to walk through the project that we had, uh, how we went about it, our thoughts along the way, and yeah. So um, myself, uh, my name is Harrison. I work as a security consultant at a Norwegian cybersecurity company called Mnemonic. Uh, so my day-to-day -day work is mainly in uh, application security, pen testing, mobile apps, IoT, bit of everything, plus plus. Um, but yeah, if you want to reach out to me, uh, feel free. Uh, you can LinkedIn, whatever, um, email, uh, if you have any questions, of course. So. And uh, my name is Andreas. I also obviously work at uh, Mnemonic as a colleague to uh, Harrison, also within the application security field. Uh, I have a background as a hardware engineer. So uh, if you remember the old phones from the keynote speech, I actually worked on the hardware on those back in the day. So that's uh, a bit older than Harrison. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I'm uh, happy to see there were no screenshots from Sony Ericsson phones, so I guess we didn't have uh, any malware uh, back, in the, back in the day. <laughs> All right. Yes, uh, I guess I jumped the gun a bit. Um, but yeah, so we're, uh, we're going to walk through uh, the tests on the EV charger, um, talk a bit about our uh, motivation as to why we wanted to do it. Um, uh, along the way, bring up some points uh, about uh, you know IoT security, kind of our thoughts and uh, our observations, and uh, then of course our findings and potential areas for improvement. Um, just to kind of start off as a, a, a disclaimer, um, we did uh, this was uh, the project was sponsored by Mnemonic in terms of like we did it during our work hours. Um, we were not affiliated with Zaptec, the company that makes the charger. They didn't pay us. We didn't talk to them during the test. We literally just went to the store, bought it, did the testing. Um, before we, we published a blog post, before we did that, we let them know. But uh, yeah, this is basically just our independent work at our regular job. Um, and then also, we limited the testing uh, to the hardware that we owned. We didn't do any kind of active testing against uh, Zaptec. I normally get questions as to why I just wanted to throw it in. Um, but at the end, they did send us swag, so I got a nice laptop case. That's <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, high level, like we kind of, we had some time, we wanted to uh, look into something IoT, um, and then uh, kind of something that came across uh, our minds was EV chargers. Um, uh, kind of some areas that, uh, or some reasons we thought it was interesting, uh, there hadn't been a ton of public research in, uh, in the field, or at least, uh, yeah, Googling around didn't seem uh, like it was, yeah, not that many researchers had uh, looked into it. Um, it's something that uh, society relies on. Uh, so as, you know, more and more people buy electric cars, uh, an electric car charger is more or less replacing a gas station. And if you ask me, they're kind of important. We need to be able to go places and do stuff. Um, it's a relatively new market. So these, uh, you know, the devices are new. They haven't uh, been around for a while. Uh, in Norway, at least, where we're based, you know, over 80% of new car sales in Norway are uh, electric vehicles. So it is a huge, uh, yeah, uh, basically a like, huge infrastructure um, uh, for these uh, chargers. Um, and it's made by new companies. Uh, so, you know, some of these uh, companies, these are the first products they've put onto the market. Um, that maybe, uh, you know, they're, they're not bad, but of course, like if you think uh, the quality of something that a startup is going to put out there uh, could be a bit different than something that Google or Apple or whatever is going to put out there. So it's uh, more, they haven't had as much experience and maybe more likely to have mistakes and more likely for us to find cool things to talk about. Um, so yeah, we, uh, you know, there's a few different brands out there. Uh, we ended up on uh, Zaptec or looking into, yep, yeah, the Zaptec line of uh, chargers. They, uh, basically had two different models uh, that were available. One was the Zaptec Go, and one was the Zaptec Pro. The Go is essentially for home use. You install it in your garage. Uh, the Pro uh, was more designed for like bigger installations, so you could think like a parking garage or like an airport or whatever, where you have multiple chargers connected to a single circuit, and they kind of need to distribute. The, so they, they basically have like networking capabilities to talk together, and some management portals on the back end. Um, 
Yeah, and, and of course, uh, we thought it was more interesting, uh, you know, if we were to potentially find a vulnerability, uh, finding something where you could get free charging at a garage was much more interesting than uh, stealing electricity from your neighbor. So, <laughs> uh, oops. yeah, so uh, Zaptec Pro compared to, there was uh, one other company that was a bit prevalent uh, at the time. Uh, now it's mainly Zaptec, but yeah, they were uh, everywhere. If you drive through Oslo, that's one of the biggest uh, companies that you're gonna see. Um, it had a lot of functionality. Um, so like, even myself, I didn't really think about it at first. You just plug in and charge and that's it. But uh, if you actually like read the data sheets, it has Bluetooth Low Energy, it has Wi-Fi, it has a SIM card for 4G, PLC, uh, which is like Ethernet over power cables. Uh, it's actually the same or very similar to the protocol. Like if you ever had like an Ethernet extender in your house, you plug it into the wall, one cable in, another adapter, cable out, same, basically the same thing. And they, they use that for load balancing between the different chargers, kind of interesting. And it's also what we had in the basement of our office, so I was kind of familiar with it, and yep, helped. Very high level architecture. Uh, probably not a huge surprise, but uh, just kind of describing how it works uh, before I go on a bit further. Uh, the charger um, talks up to the internet. You can kind of configure how you want to do that. It'll uh, uh, either through Wi-Fi or PLC or 4G. Uh, Zaptec has some infrastructure running in Azure. Um, that uh, cloud infrastructure uh, provides, or they have APIs that they expose. Uh, and then third parties uh, for like EasyPark or in Norway, a common uh, app that people use is Fortum. So basically just the, the app you have on your phone, uh, those are gonna be operated by like a parking garage company, for example. You download that, uh, that integrates with Zaptex APIs, and then uh, that's how you kind of control like charging sessions, like start, stop, uh, how much electricity did you use, so on and so forth. Yes. So, uh, kind of telling the story of uh, where our mind was uh, in the project uh, before we even bought anything. Uh, I, the other side, you could see the prices. It was like 20,000 Norwegian crowns for this thing, so we didn't want to buy something that we would present, like wasn't going to be worth it to look into. Uh, so like that's, yeah, ish 22,000 euros or something. So wanted to get good value out of it. Uh, so we did a lot of reconnaissance. Uh, digging into uh, the documentation that Zaptec publicly released, you could actually find a lot about how the charger worked without even buying it. Um, so yeah, just going into their developer portals, they had uh, Swagger documentation, you could see all the APIs that they exposed. Um, they had portals uh, for like if you're a, that parking garage company and you need to manage your uh, infrastructure, you can log into this portal and presumably, we didn't get access to it, but presumably there you can see and like, yep, do whatever you need to do. Um, they had a lot of marketing material, uh, and uh, I know it's kind of small, but they had like, I, I don't remember exactly how many pages, but this was like uh, maybe 50, 100 page PDF with all of the data flows for how their APIs worked. They, they basically just like threw it out there, here's everything we have. Uh, so, so really, really nice uh, just to kind of understand how the product worked. Um, uh, this is a bit of my personal uh, rant on certificate transparency logs, even though it really doesn't have any thing to do much <laughs> with the project in the end. Uh, but I really liked using this for, or I really like to use this on my engagements when I do application security tests as well. Uh, basically, if you're not already familiar, when you go to a certificate authority to request a certificate, uh, there's rules in place where the certificate authority has to uh, publish publicly which certificates that they have issued. And I guess the idea behind this is like, I can monitor my own certificates, and if I'm supposed to be using Let's Encrypt and I see another company issuing a cert, it'd be like, oh, what's that cert doing? And then you can kind of, it's like an audit feature functionality, basically. And what's nice about it is that it's public, and you can type in a domain and see all the certificates that they've issued for subdomains for that domain. So uh, they might not all be connected to the internet, of course, but uh, you can, like, sometimes they are, and you can see, we actually found some of the documentation that we found was uh, actually like we didn't find links directly on their website, so we kind of clicked, uh, we like went through these, browsed, clicked around, and sometimes we found some, yeah, found some stuff. So uh, something to keep in mind if you're ever, uh, if you're a developer and you're developing stuff, uh, I have done tests on, uh, for companies where like they have like an internal project uh, with like a code name or something, and then they are issuing certs for that project before they release the marketing material, so just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, yes, so, uh, also looked at the uh, mobile applications. Uh, 
So uh, this was something you could just download from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store. I'm an uh, Android, uh, I work with a lot of Android stuff, so I started with the Android version. Um, and that's really nice, even though we, uh, you know, it was, it's mainly, basically the app is mainly for if you're a home user and you're trying to install the Zeptech Go version, but there's also some uh, functionality for um, installers uh, so you can kind of configure the charger with Bluetooth Low Energy um, when you're like installing it in a parking garage, so you can like configure how the Wi-Fi network and, and uh, the mesh network uh, connectivity and stuff like that. Um, and it's uh, really nice with Android uh, stuff because you can uh, throw it into a decompiler quite often. And uh, I know it's small, but uh, essentially this was just a list of uh, the functions that the app had for Bluetooth Low Energy that it, uh, basically the list of Bluetooth Low Energy functions that the app had to communicate with the charger. So like these, even though we couldn't, uh, we didn't have full access to this because yeah, various reasons, but uh, we could kind of keep in the back of our mind like what functionality it supported at least. So it's kind of interesting uh, and you could do it without buying anything. So cool to keep in mind. Yes, and Andreas is gonna talk about the teardown when we bought it. All right, so uh, as you understood, we did a fair bit of uh, reconnaissance uh, in advance. After all, it's uh, kind of a pricey equipment to just open up and randomly break parts. Uh, so we wanted to uh, see what we could do uh, to uh, first. So uh, we did uh, actually um, hook it up to uh, power and uh, internet and whatever to just see if we could uh, do anything with it at all. And, um, it uh, actually has, for instance, an SSH uh, server running. Uh, we did some pickups and uh, noticed that it has some traffic to Azure IoT Hub and, and so on. But the thing is that uh, this is the pro version, so you actually need to be an installer to be able to uh, make it do anything. And since we don't have any um, service uh, accounts or whatever, we couldn't really uh, do anything. So uh, next step is actually to, um, which is my, uh, my favorite part, to actually open it up and uh, see what it looks like uh, on the inside. So uh, here is a picture uh, of uh, what it looks. And um, it's uh, kind of, uh, it's a nice uh, design um, for an, um, from an electrical engineering perspective. I think it's a really nice design actually. Uh, and I didn't work at Subtech, I promise. Um, <laughs> so you can see uh, there is uh, basically two, uh, two PCBs or two boards, one uh, in the back of the device and one on the, on the top. Uh, to the left, you see some uh, circuit breakers. Uh, there is a fair bit of current going through these uh, things, so isolation is obviously quite important. Uh, so the circuit breakers on the left and then some relays on the top that uh, makes satisfying clicking noises when you connect your car. Uh, and uh, then uh, we uh, mainly focus on the top board, which is the IoT, IoT board. Um, and what we usually do, we uh, take a look at the board, we uh, notice what uh, different parts it has and we use uh, our, uh, our Google Foo uh, uh, knowledge to uh, figure out what parts are there and uh, we start looking around for uh, potential ways into uh, into the board uh, and our main goal is obviously to take control over the device uh, by hopefully getting uh, root or getting access to the firmware or uh, something like that. Uh, so if we look a bit closer uh, on the interesting board in this case um, we have some uh, interesting parts. Uh, on the very bottom, you see a row of pins. That's the board-to-board -board connector, which connects the, two, uh, the power board to the kind of application board. So that's how they uh, communicate with uh, each other. Uh, the green parts in the top left, we have a small uh, speaker that makes uh, beep beep when you connect the car. <laughs> uh, and I can already now reveal that it, uh, we actually made it play jingle bells at some point. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there is also an RGB uh, LED, which is extremely bright when you don't have the lid on. So we actually have to tape it down with some, uh, some tape to make it a bit more uh, diffused. Um, the blue parts, we can see a small uh, IC and also uh, 
some weird patterns around the subtech logo. That's the RFID uh, uh, part. So it's an antenna for RFID and a, a chipset to, uh, to control it. So basically when you charge your car, you connect your car and then you have a small uh, RFID tag that you uh, bleep on, on, the, on the thing and then it authenticates and, and so on. So that's, that's what handles uh, that. The yellow part in the top right um, is uh, a 4G modem and uh, the antenna to the far uh, right. So it uh, connects uh, through mobile uh, networks. Uh, the orange is um, a power, uh, a Qualcomm chipset to uh, facilitate the, the PL PLC um, uh, communication over power lines that was uh, mentioned uh, previously. Uh, the purple part is a PIC or PIC microcontroller. Uh, and now I don't remember what that was for. No. Um, but some something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, we actually didn't spend that much time looking into it, but I, I think it has to do with uh, like basically like starting, stopping and starting the charge sessions. So like, yeah, it has some logic for that. <laughs> yeah. So. So basically, uh, among other things, probably uh, making the satisfying relay clicking uh, noises, I guess. Uh, but the most important and interesting parts for us is uh, in the red uh, square, where we actually have the application side. So we have a, an ARM Cortex-A7 uh, microcontroller, or based ARM-based microcontroller. And uh, we have uh, one NAND uh, flash chip, that's the one uh, to the left, and uh, a small uh, RAM chip to the right. So this is uh, what we are, uh, what we are uh, stuck with to, uh, yeah, to start poking around. And uh, maybe you already now see that uh, right next to the NAND chip, uh, there is an interesting unpopulated uh, pinout. Uh, that's uh, that's a good uh, good starting point. So um, since this was an ARM processor, we are looking for some uh, interfaces. It could be JTAG, for instance, or SWD, which is the ARM uh, ARM equivalent of JTAG, so to speak. Uh, or potentially a UART serial port is also very common to um, to find. The SWD port, if we find it, and if it's enabled, it's, uh, it's a good starting point because that could potentially uh, uh, enable us to dump the firmware um, immediately. Uh, so if we get lucky, we find, uh, we find uh, that. Uh, and the ARM, processor, the ARM processor itself obviously has all these pins on the chip itself. But uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but in the very bottom right, that's the ARM chip, and it's a so-called uh, BGA uh, chip, which means that all the pins are on the un underside. And since it's a multi-layer PCB, it's quite impossible to uh, uh, actually access the pins. Uh, desoldering and reballing and resoldering a BGA chip is not something we uh, usually do on a daily, <laughs> on a daily basis. <laughs> uh, so, we uh, were uh, going for um, more low-hanging fruit, and the unpopulated pin header is obviously a good uh, candidate. Uh, if we zoom in on the bottom uh, pin, you can see that it has small uh, bridges to the ground plane, so that's obviously a ground pin, and that leaves us with uh, two other signal pins. So, at this point, we think that this is either SWD, which uses two, two uh, data pins, or it's a uh, UART. Uh, or it could be nothing, i.e. Uh, disabled in firmware or something like that. So uh, hopefully we, uh, we find something. So we just basically hook it up to a logic analyzer and uh, try to figure out uh, what kind of signals uh, there is and what kind of data is uh, transferred. And it turns out that this is a UART uh, interface. So uh, no luck with the SWD, but we at least uh, get some uh, ASCII art uh, with subtech and uh, a login prompt. Um, and also we get the whole startup log, which uh, will turn out to be useful later because it contains a lot of good information on uh, how the hardware is actually uh, configured. Uh, we obviously tried uh, brute forcing the password uh, without any success. 
and uh, we actually realized later why we didn't succeed, but uh, I will leave that as a cliffhanger. Uh, <laughs> Also, uh, in some cases, you can actually interrupt the boot process by some uh, magic uh, keyboard uh, uh, shortcuts, but uh, they had uh, locked the bootloader, so um, no, uh, no luck there. So basically, we find a UART prompt with a login uh, prompt, but uh, yeah, couldn't really um, move uh, any further. Uh, then we took uh, another uh, in-depth look of the, of the board, and we realized that uh, one of the metal things next to uh, these chips were actually a SD card slot. Uh, <laughs> so we just tried uh, putting a random SD card into the slot and booting up and see what happened, and it didn't boot, obviously. But that was a good thing, because that means that it actually tried to access the SD card. So, uh, or we could have bricked the device. We didn't, we didn't know at this point. But at least it didn't start. Uh, but uh, we uh, thought that this is probably a, a good thing. So we tried uh, Googling around for uh, development boards that looked similar and tried to uh, flash various uh, images to the SD card. Um, and basically, try to get, uh, get it booting. And some sort of worked, others crashed, and we got various uh, uh, error messages. But um, hopefully, we didn't uh, uh, break anything. But in the end, we figured out that, OK, uh, we might be able to uh, make it boot through the SD card. But uh, hardware changes uh, means that we need to do configuration to the, um, if we are running our own uh, boot software. So we need, we need to figure out how, how the hardware actually works. OK, so uh, what do we do? We need to get the firmware somehow to get the hardware uh, configuration. And uh, yeah, we kind of uh, wanted to avoid it. And we tried uh, other means of extracting the firmware. But uh, in the end, we uh, basically uh, went to uh, AliExpress and bought uh, a rework station, uh, cheap Chinese uh, hot air uh, station works uh, works fine, except that we uh, <laughs> happen to scratch uh, the board under the ship, but it still works. <laughs> but at least um, we managed to desolder um, the the NAND. Uh, not the best of work, but uh, yeah, it's it works fine. Um, it helps to have this heat-resistant tape called uh, Kapton tape. Or if you buy the Chinese equivalent, it's uh, Krapton tape. Uh, <laughs> it still uh, resists some heat, so it works, uh, works fine. So we managed, to, uh, yeah, we managed to desolder the ship. And uh, back to uh, AliExpress uh, and buy a, a chip reader, or yeah, chip flash reader thing. Um, and that's actually uh, one of the points nowadays. Uh, you can buy all kinds of uh, development uh, stuff uh, very cheap from uh, certain uh, countries. So uh, back in the day, you needed like this was super expensive, like uh, flash, uh, ROM flash uh, things. But now you can buy it quite cheap on the internet. So this kind of research is actually quite uh, available for uh, for. Uh, Everyday hardware, uh, aspiring hardware hackers. So I would uh, encourage you all to go to uh, AliExpress and buy <laughs> buy stuff like that and just start poking around. It's it's uh, really fun. Um, so we have uh, an adapter for this particular NAND flash, and uh, we used the uh, accompanying uh, Chinese uh, software, uh, and we actually uh, managed to extract the firmware. So now we have a desoldered uh, chip, and we actually managed to resolder it, and it still works. <laughs> but now we also have a copy of the firmware. And uh, Harrison will uh, continue talking a little bit more about the firmware. Yes, so, like Andrea said, now the tool uh, that you just saw spit out uh, a binary file, it was like a byte for byte copy of uh, what was present on the NAND flash. Um, one slight issue with that is that uh, when you're working with NAND, very often you have a controller in front of it. Uh, 
that manages. Uh, so basically, like when you yeah, when you have a NAND flash chip, uh, you have um, wear leveling so that uh, the chip doesn't get written to in the same spot over and over and over again. So there's some logic that says like, oh, this sector has been written to too many times. I'll write over here instead or uh, has like error correction. So if there's some kind of uh, corruption in the chip, it'll try and be smart and fix, uh, fix itself. Um, so the controller manages all this uh, with uh, something called out of band data. And I stole this slide. Uh, there was a presentation at uh, Hack in the Box Amsterdam in 2019. Um, and from the, yeah, they just had a nice uh, kind of visualization of how that works. Uh, there's two different ways to do it. The chip we had was actually the one on the left. So you'd have like data, data, data and then a block of out-of-band data, which was uh, yeah, for the previous block above it, and then so on and so forth, all the way down the chip. And the problem with that is that if we wanted to read the flash as if like the way that uh, Linux would see it, uh, just one consecutive dump, the out-of-band data was getting in the way, and uh, of course that like corrupts the image. Um, so uh, we were very thankful, and uh, I, I, uh, if you do end up working on ARM processors and doing anything similar, uh, or actually, or this specific chip, I highly recommend watching that uh, presentation. Um, really good. They released a tool uh, which uh, you could give it the binary file that came out of the flash uh, dumping software, read the out-of-band data, uh, did all of the error correction. So like if there was an error in the flash uh, dump that I took, it would actually try and do that error correction. And then it would uh, spit out uh, a, a consecutive uh, like image, basically something that I could potentially melt in, uh, in Linux. So super, super useful. And I was uh, very thankful that this tool existed because it would have taken a lot of time otherwise. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that uh, back to kind of like where we were stuck before on the uh, looking into the charger. There was, uh, we wanted to kind of have a, we wanted to boot to another operating system. Uh, kind of like if you're thinking, you know, if you wanted to, uh, you know, if you forget about BitLocker and all that stuff you have nowadays, normally if you wanted to like look at uh, files on a laptop for forensic purposes, really easy to just pop in an Ubuntu image mount up the hard drive and see all the data. Essentially, we're trying to do the same thing, but uh, on a IoT device. So we wanted to boot into uh, like a running system. Um, so uh, so yeah, so to get that running system and to kind of make our image uh, that would work on the SD card, we needed something called a device tree. And what a device tree is, is essentially like a mapping, or it's a lot of things, but uh, high level, it's a mapping of uh, hardware components. So uh, when you build a board, like so you have a development board, an example board that the manufacturer puts out there so people can kind of build on that chipset. Uh, you know, the RAM is going to be connected to some pins, the flash memory is going to be connected to some pins and everything. And there's a lot of different configurations and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And this device tree basically says RAM connected here, memory connected here, and it's just a mapping of all those uh, connections, more or less. And uh, because the board we were testing on was developed by Zaptec uh, and they made some modifications uh, from the development board, we needed to know that pin mapping. Theoretically, I guess if we had uh, some kind of x-ray machine, you could have seen the traces and like literally gone, but nah, it's gonna take too much time. So we just uh, took the device tree and stole it from the image that we dumped from the flash chip. Um, yes, so uh, we took, uh, we extracted that uh, image, uh, that uh, device tree out of the image. And this allowed us to build our own bootloader. And uh, as Andreas mentioned uh, previously, what we had run into was, because uh, we kind of wanted to interrupt the boot process and start running our own code to, to get access to the box. And they had locked down the bootloader. So we weren't able to kind of interrupt that process. So we wanted to build our own bootloader with the uh, options enabled that allow us to kind of interrupt uh, and uh, run our own code. Uh, and uh, just reading the U-Boot documentation, uh, there was a flag where you could say, oh, if you have a device tree from some other place, you can kind of include it in that build process. So that's exactly what we did. Um, yeah, so literally it was just uh, download the U-Boot uh, from GitHub, uh, give it this uh, device tree file that we extracted, um, read the documentation for the ARM processor. So we had to like know where on the SD card to put it. There was a special address you had to put it to get it to boot properly. Uh, but then after you did that, uh, we put in the SD card. And uh, finally, we had a working bootloader. It uh, dropped us into a prompt or like a U-boot prompt. And uh, what we did from here uh, was that, uh, okay, it would have, Basically, uh, we ended up, uh, the easiest path we 
thought was uh, booting our own bootloader, uh, setting some, making some changes uh, to the boot process, and then pointing it back at the NAND flash that was already on the device. Um, and, and the reason that was a bit easier than, uh, or the reason that we thought that was easiest is because it had to do with like the file formats uh, and the, the, yeah, basically it, it, yeah, that was the path we chose to do at least. And uh, yeah, so uh, we, uh, so that's, that's kind of the, I know it's a mess, but that's kind of the commands that are going on here is where you basically, we get into our own bootloader, uh, we're pointing, we're setting everything up so that it's pointing to uh, boot Linux from the NAND flash uh, that's on the board. Uh, and then we enable uh, single user mode in Linux. And uh, there's a lot of Linux uh, distributions out there uh, where you can just basically set a flag in the boot options and that just bypasses authentication where it just drops you into a root prompt. Um, so we didn't know the password, uh, we didn't have access to Linux, so we just enabled the single user mode uh, once we had access to the arguments in the bootloader and it uh, dropped us uh, into a root shell and we set our own root password, and boom, now we have root. So that was nice. Yay! Hey. <laughs> so, now that we have access to a running system, we can actually start looking into uh, how it works, like what's uh, going on under the hood. Um, so we had a few different areas that we wanted to look into. Uh, I'm gonna kind of preface this, but this was not like a full pen test uh, by, by any means. Uh, we kind of just did a surface level analysis on uh, some stuff we thought was interesting. Um, but uh, one of the key areas I uh, wanted to look into first was the Bluetooth Low Energy. It would have been a really cool attack if you could walk up to the device, knew some special Bluetooth Low Energy command, and just like start a free charging session. Would have been uh, really cool to demo. Um, uh, some background on BLE. Uh, you can implement it properly. Uh, I don't think I've seen it done well very often. Uh, so if you kind of think um, like the scooters that everyone has around the city, right? Uh, that uses BLE. So uh, your phone talks BLE uh, to the scooter and you don't want to go through that pairing process for every device. That makes a terrible user experience. So a lot of the times what ends up happening is vendors kind of build their own authentication on top of Bluetooth Low Energy, which is not encrypted and has no pairing and so on and so forth. So it uh, ends up kind of like the Wild West and vendors do whatever. Uh, so we wanted to see, did they do whatever? How did that work? Um, yeah, so we wanted to basically answer, how was the pin generated? Uh, if it was based on the serial number, maybe we could make, uh, we could reverse the algorithm, look at the code, see how it's made. Um, and, and then if you had the pin, what could you do with the pin, right? Like I mentioned, start, make a free charging session, for example. Um, Yes, uh, so we looked at the code. Uh, this was actually on the Android app, another uh, view of kind of the functions that it supported over Bluetooth Low Energy, but it provides a nice overview of everything it allowed. Um, uh, I didn't highlight it, but yeah, but basically like there's some interesting stuff in there like run command, connect, authenticate, pair NFC, authorization, all these like super uh, nice looking words that uh, seem fun to look into. Uh, yeah, uh, so basically we, uh, first we looked into like a brute force attacks, right? So it's a four digit pin. Um, and uh, each pin was unique for the device. It was printed on the box. Uh, we, uh, yeah, didn't really see any user functionality to change it. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. If, if somebody were, for example, to see a pile of boxes laying on the ground, they would have been able to find the pin. Um, we did uh, look through the code running on the charger, uh, so it had some functionality to prevent brute force attacks. So if you, it's basically, it had the same similar logic to what would be on your phone. Like, so if you type in the pin too many times, it's kind of this like progressive, uh, you have to wait longer and longer and longer before the next attempt. They kind of implemented that, which is okay. Um, it would have technically been possible to sniff the pin. I think it's a bit far out because you'd have to be there at the right time in the right location like while an installer is there setting up the device and then you could sniff the pin, but theoretically, I guess it's possible. Um, we wanted to, and then, yeah, but we still didn't know at this point how it was uh, provisioned, where the pin came from. So we dug a bit further. Um, found uh, some logs, this was kind of interesting, uh, from when the device was built at the factory. So uh, what we think uh, happened, so like every device gets flashed with the, the same firmware and then it kind of goes through the assembly line, uh, at some point connects to a Wi-Fi hotspot that they have at the factory. Um, and then you can kind of, uh, 
Yeah, you can see there's an IP address uh, for whatever that uh, provisioning server was, so it connects up to this local provisioning server, and then that provisioning server writes down key material to each device to kind of make it unique. Um, and at that point uh, is when the pin gets written. So assuming that that algorithm uh, is secure, and we think it probably is, then decent way to send a pin to a device, at least. Uh, there's a lot worse ways you could do it. Uh, and it, and uh, it's blacked out, I know you can't see it, but uh, they also provision some other keys for uh, some other functionality that I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, a quick look at the Bluetooth Low Energy handler on the charger. I thought it was kind of interesting. So uh, the way that it works is it uh, has a Python uh, service listening. Um, it uses the blues or bluesy, however you say it, library. Um, and uh, that receives the incoming Bluetooth Low Energy messages sent to it. Uh, and it's in Python, so it's uh, easy to read. And we even found some uh, comments from the developers. Uh, so that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, like I mentioned, the run command was interesting. Wanted to see how that worked. So uh, what that did was uh, it actually took the command, the contents of whatever you sent it, and then passed it off to another service running locally on the charger uh, that was written in .NET. Uh, so uh, they used a communication protocol between themselves called dbus. So now we need to go look at the code that actually handled the, the run command function. Uh, and this is the disassembled uh, .NET. Um, a bit uh, more fuzzy, but basically we uh, figure out that uh, there's uh, basically, okay, so if I want to run a command, because uh, obviously your mind goes to like, oh, can I run Linux commands? But no, uh, unfortunately not. Uh, you, could run, you could have a command to restart the charger or uh, like trigger a firmware update where it would call out to Zaptec and see if there's any up updates available. Um, so in the end, it kind of ended up being a dead end, um, but uh, still kind of cool to, to figure out how it worked. Um, so in the end, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, we didn't like look at every single service in depth, so I'm sure there could potentially be something out there, but uh, it didn't really seem like there was much to do other than kind of reconfiguring the device. You could, if you had the pin and you found a way to get the pin, you could maybe connect it to a different Wi-Fi network and make it stop working. Um, but it would be uh, yeah, a very local attack against that one device and yeah, a bit limited scope what you could do. Uh, wanted to look into the SSH listener that we saw earlier and uh, uh, we found out why we couldn't do brute force attacks is because they had uh, disabled password based authentication which is uh, good. Uh, but what they uh, opted for uh, instead was uh, authentication based on SSH keys. So those SSH keys are provisioned to uh, all the devices. They're all the same. So presumably at Zaptec, there's two private keys uh, that allow them to authenticate to any of their devices. Um, I know there's a whole other discussion about uh, is this okay? Should they be doing this? And you could have that discussion, but uh, I've seen it uh, very often in the industry. So at least they're doing what the industry is doing and they didn't have password-based authentication. So okay, I guess. Um, so that was a SSH. And then we also wanted to look into the cloud connectivity. So this is kind of like where the, mainly what the charger does on a day-to-day -day basis when you start ch charging sessions and so on and so forth. Um, so once we had Brute, we already knew that it was talking to Azure because we had done PCAPs and we saw it connecting up to Azure domains, but we couldn't see what that traffic was. Now that we had Brute running on the device, we could install our own uh, custom uh, root certificate, our own root CA, and we used uh, Midim proxy to intercept that TLS communication, uh, and uh, we were able to decrypt the PCAPs that we took uh, of this uh, traffic. So uh, we find out that it's using the Azure IoT Hub uh, product, um, which is kind of, it's based on uh, MQTT, which is a messaging service quite commonly used by IoT devices. Um, it authenticates with shared access signatures, which is good as well, uh, and that uh, key was provisioned earlier when uh, I talked to, you saw the screenshot from the logs. Um, so that was kind of cool. Uh, just a side note, didn't really have to do too much with security, I don't think, but uh, I thought it was kind of cool. It was, uh, this was a screenshot of the, uh, one of the JSON blobs that it was sending up to the cloud. So like whenever it reports uh, how much electricity has been used uh, like, yeah, for the device, uh, that's what it looks like. So it's uh, this actually, uh, it's called open charge metering format. It's an open standard that they use to kind of, yeah, send that type of data, so kind of cool. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the, the cloud functionality was uh, huge. They had tons of stuff. Uh, as part of that, we found some uh, debugging functionality uh, that Zaptec had. So if they needed to look into their device or uh, like, yeah, there, maybe a customer was having a problem or maybe for development purposes. Um, 
yeah, there was a lot of stuff in there. For example, uh, we found a command called uh, cloud command response. And uh, that basically takes the contents of something that they push up to the cloud uh, portal, and the device uh, grabs that down and plops it into uh, a Linux uh, command. Um, so basically, that allows Zaptec to run commands as root on any other devices via the cloud. So kind of cool, uh, or cool. <laughs> um, it's fairly normal in the industry, uh, but again, uh, if I was Zaptec, I'd be very careful who has access to this, because um, you can kind of imagine, like, somebody gets access they're not supposed to, you could brick all the devices at once, uh, which would be bad. Um, another similar command that they had uh, was called the start remote tunnel. Actually, no, yeah, I messed up before. It was called run, run remote command. That was the other one. Uh, start remote tunnel was the second command. And uh, this was kind of interesting. So this was kind of like a reverse shell functionality where they would send a command to the charger and in that command, they would specify an IP address, and then the charger with that IP address would connect up to it uh, with an onboard SSH private key that the chargers had, and then uh, essentially that would establish like an SSH connection up to Zaptec from the charger, and I guess they would use that if they needed to like SSH into the box directly and maybe get access to the network and do stuff. So that was kind of uh, having a private uh, key on the device I don't know what IP they would have been connecting up to. So without that IP, it would have been a bit tricky, and we, of course, uh, kind of didn't want to test their infrastructure without their permission. Um, but that could potentially be, if, they, if that's not secure, something uh, could be kind of easy to mess up. Um, so yeah, uh, all in all, um, like, if I had to say it wasn't terrible, I was actually expecting it to be a lot worse, especially because uh, it was uh, new. So I'll say, you know, it's, it was much better than a lot of other devices from startups that I've seen. Um, but, and, and I didn't really want to hold them to the same level uh, as Google and Amazon, although it would be great if everybody could kind of make really secure devices. It's, uh, it's really hard for startups, you know, there's a lot of competition to get stuff out to market quickly. Um, so I can see why they weren't at that point. So, you know, if, uh, if they wanted to make a roadmap for stuff to improve on, I would have said secure boot. Uh, so that we, you know, you would need signed firmware for every step and uh, they wouldn't have allowed us to boot our custom bootloader because it wasn't signed with their private key. If they encrypted the firmware on that NAND flash chip, we wouldn't have been able to read its contents uh, and get that uh, device tree file. Uh, an easy fix or an easy uh, security practice would be to disable the debug interfaces, wouldn't have gotten access to that UART port. And uh, of course, like just generally disabled booting from an SD card. So like some small stuff you, they could have put in there. And uh, with that, thank you.